Welcome to the very first episode of Game Plunge, a series all about the analysis and discussion of game design. We try to answer the question of why games are fun, rather than if they are fun. Every episode we'll be looking at one particular game and dive deep into their mechanics to dissect what makes it good or what makes it bad. But before we can start analyzing any games, we need to establish some basic principles of game design. So in this episode, we'll be discussing some tools we can use for analyzing games. When talking about game design, it is very important to know about aesthetics. But what are aesthetics? Well, they can be described as the reasons why users would play a game. In the fundamental theory of game design, eight main aesthetics have been established. They are a powerful tool when it comes to analyzing games, because pretty much every game follows at least a few of these main aesthetics. So, what are these main aesthetics exactly? The first aesthetic is sensation. Games which have the sensation as their main aesthetic focus on stimulating and pleasing your senses. So for instance, games you play for their incredible music or amazing visuals. Think of Crisis for instance. Another great example of the sensation aesthetic is Guitar Hero, where you are bombarded with amazing colors and music. You don't even need to play the game to enjoy its sensation aesthetic. Just merely looking at it and listening to it can be really satisfying. Second is the fantasy aesthetic. This involves games where you can pretend to be something else. Games which let you escape from reality. Most role playing games incorporate this aesthetic of pretending to be something else. Just like the name implies. Role playing. Which is exactly what this aesthetic is all about. One example is Skyrim, where you can create your own character and live inside a fantasy world where you can do pretty much anything you want. But games like FIFA also use the fantasy aesthetic, because they too let you pretend to be something else. In the case of FIFA, that would be a football coach or even a football player. The narrative aesthetic is all about stories. These can simply be a classic story the player can follow, like in Metal Gear Solid, where you discover more and more of the story as you go along. But it can also involve a player-generated story, which wasn't really predetermined. Think for instance of The Sims, where through the actions you decide to take, you generate your own story and background for your Sims. This way of being able to generate your own story is also part of the narrative aesthetic. Like the word suggests, the challenge aesthetic is all about challenging experiences. Games with the challenge aesthetic are all about overcoming obstacles. These obstacles are often chosen to be very difficult. Some examples are Super Meat Boy or Dark Souls, which appeal to players because of their relentless difficulty. But the obstacles chosen in the challenge aesthetic don't have to be incredibly difficult. For instance, puzzle games also incorporate the challenge aesthetic, since their main goal is solving the problems presented. In other words, all you do is overcoming obstacles. But even incredibly easy puzzle games still have the challenge aesthetic. So make no mistake, challenge doesn't always imply difficulty and even easy games can still have the challenge aesthetic. The fellowship aesthetic is all about the social side of gaming. It is any game where you can work together with your friends or with a community towards the same goals. Think of games like Team Fortress 2, where you can work together with your friends to defeat your opponents. But the fellowship aesthetic can also exist on a much larger scale. Like in Cloud Chamber, in this game the entire community has to work together to find clues inside a series of video messages to progress through the game. 
that cooperation amongst users is what a fellowship aesthetic is all about. This aesthetic is one of the more broad aesthetics in the list. Discovery can mean a lot of things. It can be finding new areas in a game like Skyrim. But it can also be the discovery of easter eggs and secrets in a game like Grand Theft Auto. Or even the discovery of new ways to use the game's mechanics and tools which you can find in Gary's mod. If a game has a lot of hidden areas, secret crafting recipes, unlockable skills or even just a large map for you to explore, then that game's got the discovery aesthetic. Games with the expression aesthetic are all about the creativity of the players. It preys on your desire to express yourself in unique and interesting ways. Think of building some amazing structure in Minecraft for example. Or finding a really unique way to solve a puzzle in Scribblenauts. But it can also be in the way that you designed your character in games like Saints Row. Whenever a game lets the player decide what to do or what to make, then that's a sign of the expression aesthetic. Finally, the submission aesthetic. This is all about zoning out and just mindlessly playing a game. Now this may seem like a rather unappealing aesthetic at first, but you might have encountered this aesthetic without even realizing it. Think for instance when you grinded for hours on end in an RPG game just to find that rare loot you were looking for. Or when you mindlessly mine for hours in Minecraft to find some sweet diamonds. The best example of the submission aesthetic for me is Proteus. You can just walk around without any clear goal and just zone out completely enjoying your surroundings. It calms you down and for a while nothing really seems to matter anymore. This is at the heart of the submission aesthetic. Now why are aesthetics important? Well, they are a key element for understanding what makes games fun and intriguing. Aesthetics are an important part of a powerful tool for analyzing games. The MDA Framework So what is the MDA Framework? It stands for Mechanics, Dynamics and Aesthetics. It shows the fundamental difference between how players experience a game and how the developers experience it. When a developer creates a game, they have to start with making the mechanics behind the game. These are the very basic principles of a video game. So think for instance of Portal, where one of the mechanics is shooting portals. MDA asks, what consequences does this mechanic have on the players of the game? Well, this brings us to our next step. Dynamics. These are often misunderstood because they can be quite vague. Basically, dynamics result in aesthetic experiences. That is still quite vague, so let's look at our example. Remember, we had the mechanic of shooting portals. This mechanic gives us the dynamic of creating puzzles using the space around you. This in turn results in one of our aesthetics we mentioned before, challenge. We could also add the mechanic of a timer to portal. The dynamic this creates is time pressure, which in turn adds to the challenge aesthetic as well. Let's look at a few more examples. A mechanic in Team Fortress 2 is the ability to overcharge one of your allies. This creates the dynamic of assisting other players and results in the aesthetic of fellowship. A mechanic in Mass Effect is the ability to branch into different dialogue trees. This creates the dynamic of immersion, which results in the aesthetic of fantasy. A key thing to remember is that developers and players perceive games from the opposite ends of the MDA framework. Developers first need to start developing algorithms to make the mechanics of a game work, and from that they can build a player experience. On the other hand, players are directly exposed to the aesthetics of a game, 
and perceive games from the other end of the framework. So why is all of this important? Do all game developers use this framework to design their games? No, they don't. So what's its use then? Well, its use is exactly what this series is for. Properly analyzing games. To improve your skills as a designer, it is very helpful to analyze games and figure out just exactly what is fun about them. And that is precisely what I'm going to be doing with this series. This was just a basic lesson of the fundamental game theory which can be used to support the analysis of video games. In future episodes, we will be using this to dive deep into the design of games and figure out what makes them good or what makes them bad. That's it for this episode and I hope to see you next time.